try to introduce to member of the society is that three new name plaque that on the wall of the Society for Vascular Surgery Office. This is Dr. Peter Gawiski when he was president that initiated this project. There are names on these three plaque. The first one is Society for Vascular Surgery from the beginning to the time of merger in 2003. The second one is from International Society for Cardiovascular Surgery, North American Chapter, ISCVSNA, and later on changed to American Association for Vascular Surgery. And the third one is the new SVS of the merger. The first president of Society for Vascular Surgery in 1947 is Dr. Elton Oxler. Dr. DeBakey was president in 1954. In our interview program, I certainly feel there are quite a few of the president that we missed in the view, such as 1977 Jesse Thompson, Dr. Emmerich Silagi in 1983, Dr. Stanley Koffer in 1988. Those are superstars that we missed the opportunity to interview them. Move up to the second plaque, which is belong to AAVS. Their president start in 52, a few years behind the SVS. And then the third one is a new SVS after merger. By looking at these three plaque, they are altogether 66 years. In all these 60 years, when you look at all the names, there's not a single woman surgeon or resident of the society. Today, we are going to interview Dr. Julie Fleshlet, our first woman's president. Dr. Marina Kibbe and Dr. Walter McCarthy will be the interviewer. And we are looking forward to talking to our first woman surgeon became a president of our society. Several years ago, the Society for Vascular Surgery decided to put together a video archive of innovators and leaders in the field. And uh, the idea was to have that material accessible to people who are interested in the future. And today we have Julianne Freischlag with us, who is a dean at the medical school of, at the University of California, Davis, and is the most recent uh, uh, chairman of surgery at Johns Hopkins, where she was the Halstead uh, Professor of Surgery and Chairman. And she's also the first woman president of the SVS. So welcome, Julie. Thanks so much. And we've got uh, Melina Kibbe here today and Jim Yao, and we're going to uh, talk over some things about your career. Great. Melina's going to start. Julie, thanks for being here. Let's start with, tell us where you were born and where you were raised. Sure. Well, thanks for doing this. This is exciting to, to talk about sort of your career and to actually um, have these things available to young people. I watch them, so I think they're, they're really important. So I was born in Decatur, Illinois, not too far from here, about two and a half hours south of Chicago. Um, the town is known for high flyer kites, which are the old yellow kites and soybeans. And my dad uh, was circulation manager of the small newspaper there. And 
during my youth, we moved a lot because he went and worked for the chain of newspapers for that uh, newspaper in Carbondale and in Urbana. And then he became circulation manager of the Chicago Tribune, so we moved up oh. to Hinsdale, Illinois, and I finished high school in Hinsdale at Hinsdale South. So I went to three grade schools, three high schools, and then ended up going to the University of Illinois uh, for undergrad and then Rush Medical School for medical school. So I see a theme that's going to play out a little <laughs> bit later. Um, and what about your mother and did you have any siblings? Yes, well my mom was a school teacher. Uh, she actually became an elementary school teacher back when you could be a teacher with two years of experience. So she never ever quite finished her degree. We spent a couple summers trying to do that where I took care of my younger brother, but she was a teacher and when um, I was in high school she was a substitute teacher. So she worked a lot but not every day. I have an older brother who's uh, one year older than me, but I skipped first grade, so we were in the same grade our whole lives, and he is a venture capitalist that works in Atlanta, Georgia. And then I have a younger brother who's seven years younger than me, and he's a special ed high school teacher. He teaches emotionally and behaviorally disturbed high school kids in Downers Grove. And he also is a really good tennis player. He actually is still on the circuit uh, in his 50s and went to college on a tennis scholarship and has been ranked for uh, senior uh, tennis players. Oh my gosh. So tell us, where did your interest in pursuing a career in surgery begin? Where did it come from? Because it sounds like nobody in your family is in no. medicine or surgery? No one at all. And uh, partly I was really a great science and math kid. So I was probably a STEM back before they knew the word STEM for women. Uh, I went to college really to be a teacher like my mom. I wanted to be a high school biology teacher. And when I got to college, they had decided to close education in the mid-70s because they thought there were going to be too many teachers. Mm -hmm. So I had to like quickly downshift. I was in liberal arts and sciences, loved biology, and was a biology major. To be a nurse, you had to leave University of Illinois and come back to Chicago your senior year. And I was in a sorority, and I didn't want to leave after three years. So I went to looking for alternative um, careers. And at that time, you know, everyone was pre-med. It was the late 70s. So I decided to apply to medical school, mainly because I wanted to uh, stay in science, stay down there for four years. And I really thought that uh, academic surgery, teaching and looking at innovation was where I wanted to go. So I applied to medical school. Interesting. So you ended up uh, applying to Rush Medical School, and you were at Rush when there was a lot of vascular surgery going on. What, what are your memories of, of your medical school and surgery in, in, gen, in particular? Well, it was an interesting class, because Norma Wagner was the dean of students then, who's quite a leader. She was an anatomist. And our class that year was 42% women when we graduated in 1980. And our average age was 28. So she went looking for the unusual candidates. So when I showed up, we had a very diverse class. And many of us uh, were standard, had gone through school quickly. I was one of the youngest ones in the class. And there were quite a few uh, that also had gone through college quick. But there were also many with second degrees. So I did surgery first to get it out of the way because I knew I wasn't going to like it. I went there to be a pediatrician. And I did orthopedics and general surgery and really met uh, Steve Economo, who was a general surgeon that influenced me. In order to make more money, um, they actually hired us then as second and third year students on Sundays to go do histories and physicals on the vascular patients before, I've uh, heard about that, that's right. before <laughs> surgery. And so I would go there on Sundays, sometimes during the week, and you would do H&Ps on multiple patients, $30 a head, and make money. And that's when I first started getting to know Dr. Javid's patients and um, learning about vascular disease. We also, um, I finished med school in January because I was finished and they had an intern quit. And for reasons that I still don't understand, they hired me as an intern. Uh, so in February, March, and April of my fourth year in med school, I worked at Christ Hospital uh, and was an intern. They paid me, I did cases, I did a Whipple, I did an appendectomy, I did some vascular things, and I have no idea how that was appropriate, but they did. So when I showed up to be an intern at UCLA, I was all set. I had done 150 cases, and um, it was wonderful because it really made you confident, and also you learned how to be a great um, first assistant and a surgeon. 
At what point did you develop the interest specifically in vascular surgery? When I went to UCLA, uh, Wes Moore had just arrived. He was a new division chief my intern year, and my first two months were on vascular surgery. And also Ron Busatil was a brand new faculty member at that time, and Wiley Barker was on the service along with her MAC letter. So there was incredible energy for vascular surgery. I really loved it. Uh, they took me underneath their wing and I did my research with Ron Busatil. And then again, I did a little negotiating when I came out. You could finish general surgery with only four clinical years. So I asked Dr. Moore if that could be possible. So I didn't do my chief year and went right into the fellowship because there was no match then. So I did four years of general surgery, one year of vascular, two years of research and was doubly boarded. Wow. Okay, so that actually takes us nicely to the end of your training. Your first faculty position was at UCLA, and then shortly thereafter you went to UCSD, and shortly thereafter you went to Medical College of Wisconsin. So this is that theme we were referring right. to earlier. Right. Tell us a little bit about your choices in starting at UCLA and then going to San Diego and then ultimately to Medical College of Wisconsin. Sure. So I have a very reactive career in the first part, which is not unlike women who were training at that time. I was married to a medical oncologist. He took a fellowship, so I initially went from UCLA where I was the fellow and was sort of a semi-faculty member, went down with him during his fellowship. And then after two years, Mike Zinner came to UCLA and recruited me back to be chief of vascular at the VA, West LA VA, so I came back up. My husband at that time came back up, but then we got divorced. And after two and a half years, uh, John Town recruited me to Milwaukee. And since that's where my Midwest roots were, I decided to go back to the Midwest. And I spent six years there with that uh, department. It was great um, because I was able to be the number two person in the department. Um, I actually remember Bill Baker looking at um, John Town and said, how could you possibly have a woman as your number two person? And then he would cackle laughing, but I think he might have been a little serious. Um, and so I had a lot of opportunity there. I became chief of surgery at the VA there. I actually was uh, able to start the women's in, uh, committee there to look at women's progress at uh, Milwaukee. I was on many of the dean's committees for medical students and so it was a wonderful place and I met my husband there and had my son there. Ah. So when you're giving advice uh, in the many roles you've had of leadership, chair, now dean, to other younger faculty, um, what do you tell them about you know the positions? Do you think that the path that you took was uh, uniquely good for you or was it challenging? Would you perhaps advise other people maybe not to move around? What are your thoughts on that? Well, there's two schools of thought. I think I tell young people that there's a 50% chance that you're like your first job. Because if you look at all of us, about half of us within two to four years change. And therefore, it's important decision, but it's not a life determining decision. You may change. So just do the best you can. Set it up the best you can to do what you want to accomplish, whether it's great clinical activity or research. And realize most people will change at least once in their life. And about half their first job is not the right one. And it usually has to do with your partners. It's just not a good fit. I would not do what I did. I think I moved too quickly, but I was really lucky. But at the time, it was more of a personal choice to get to a place where you felt you were safe and happy. And I think at the time, personally, it was the right thing for me to do to go to Wisconsin and regroup. Um, also, you do get promoted faster if you move, and that's still true. So I became an associate professor at four and a half years when I moved to Wisconsin, and I also became a full professor at 10 at a smaller institution. So for the promotion piece, it was really good, but it is hard to restart clinical practice and research programs that many times. So I was very lucky. At that time, there was a lot of resources that John Town put together so I could do my uh, research and I protected time. So I think being very mindful about the changes, I always had rules that it had to have a new opportunity and it had to increase your salary by at least 50%. So if you look at opportunity like <laughs> and salary, then that would determine where you're going to go. Now, the biggest problem we have now is many are partnered with others that are either academic surgeons or surgeons or other physicians. So there's a lot of complicating factors these days now with so many uh, people being partnered with other professionals. So some decisions will have to be made in different ways, but no, you shouldn't move as much as I did. But as you know, when I was a child, I moved a lot too. So the longest I've ever lived anywhere was at Hopkins for 11 years in my life. 
Yeah, that, I do think that it's an interesting pattern throughout your life. Now, you were at UCLA as the division chief for about five years. Correct. What's your fondest memory during that time? Oh, gosh. Um, I think setting up um, how a division should work. That was right when rules were coming out about hours for residents, that you should have educational time, that people should be actually in clinics and looking at patients versus just the operating room. So I moved into the clinic there and actually set up a whole educational program for the fellows as well as the research program. So we had research meetings every week. We had pre-op meetings every week to determine what was going to happen the next week, who was assigned. We made sure people had days off each week. So I think we were the first one to organize the program. We also set up a new teaching award that they still have today that we named after Dr. Barker. And it was the fourth year excellent teaching award because we had a fourth year resident along with the fellows. So we voted on the fourth year resident Never asked if we could or couldn't, but we did. And we awarded that every year in Wiley Barker's name. And that was nice too. So that made the fourth year resident really motivated on our service. And actually, if you look at what happened over the next 15 years, many of the fourth year residents went into vascular surgery. So it really was a recruiting tool. You mentioned a lot of people so far in, you know, in the development of your career. And thinking back on it, who do you think are the most important mentors? Yeah. And I had so many. You, uh, you did. Steve Economo was just amazing. When I went in and told him I wanted to be a surgeon, it was a very different time then. In 1979, when I interviewed, I would be the only woman in the room interviewing for surgery at that time. And I was the only the sixth woman ever to finish the program at UCLA. And he didn't blink. Now, it turned out um, his son ended up in my intern class at UCLA, Steve Economo, and his daughter ended up a year behind me in otolaryngology at it. UCLA. So somehow I wonder if he sort of set us all up to be together. But he, he was, his letter, I was told, was one of the best letters, four pages long, telling them why indeed I could be a surgery resident. So he was probably one of the first. And then my chief resident, Tom Witt, also um, was the one that said I could do this. And I was on his service twice as a third year and fourth year. And to this day, he's still a great mentor. He's a breast surgeon at Rush and just an incredible person. I, I think that's what he brought to the table is how he approached a patient. At UCLA, there was Ron Bustatil, who I went into his lab, Wes Moore, who was great. Uh, and then um, Ron Tompkins, who took over the program from um, Dr. Morton. Don Morton also first hired me. They all were very... Um, energetic and really thought you could do it. I never felt that they even noticed I was female. They just knew I was good and that they really gave everybody equal opportunity. Later on, Mike Zinner is the one that hired me back to UCLA. And really, even though I left him in two and a half years to go to Milwaukee, has always been my mentor to this day and actually just came and gave a talk at UC Davis on mentoring uh, for me, for my uh, school. And then uh, certainly as I moved along to get other positions, um, Ed Miller, who hired me as uh, the chair of surgery at Hopkins, the dean who's an anesthesiologist, believed in me as well. And certainly the chancellor now at UC Davis, uh, her name is Linda Katehi, an electrical engineer. She also is showing me the way of how to lead diverse groups. So I think every way along the way I found someone the other person is George Sheldon. He was the first one that told me I should go be a chair. You know, he's recently died, um, but he had me come look at the North Carolina chair and told me that's what I should be doing because I enjoyed uh, teaching others more than just doing it myself. It turns out now both of his children live right around uh, Sacramento, and you sometimes wonder whether or not that's why you're supposed to go places, and we've recently helped one of his children with the medical illness. So. Uh, what goes around comes around, but he also was um, very instrumental. Um, and I also, I guess, Tom Russell in the college, too, because I've had a lot of roles in the college, and, and he's been there. And, and then John Town also, who really gave me a lot of energy as I rose up the ranks in the Society for Vascular Surgery. That is just a spectacular example of having multiple mentors. That was spectacular. Something else that uh, is a little um, quirky, but you are known for the smoke and rabbit research yes. that you did. All yeah. right, so we have to talk about that. Absolutely. How did that come about? <laughs> Great question. So when I took the job in Milwaukee, I was put in a, a physiology lab with a, a man named David Harder, who was a big time acetylcholine um, relaxation expert, vascular rings. 
And when we spoke to him about what causes changes in peripheral vascular disease and what were the risk factors, uh, we determined, of course, smoke as well as high cholesterol were ones that we were concerned about. And so he was the one that said maybe we should have smoke-exposed vessels. And that's when we went online and found out that R.J. Reynolds, if you can believe it, made a smoking machine that you actually set up and put cigarettes in that burned and then put the cigarette smoke into a chamber to expose animals to smoke. So we just wrote and they sent it to us. And, and it turned out about nine years later, they found out we had it and they wanted it back. But someone just sent it to me. And one of my fellows, Rich uh, Carballo, figured out how to build this chamber of 12 rabbits. Um, they, they all sat there in the little the chamber. We smoked the cigarettes. And one day he actually thought it wasn't smoking enough and opened the door in the vivarium at the VA in Milwaukee and smoked all the animals. And that was a very notable day that we got in lots of trouble uh, because smoke went everywhere. It was funny, about uh, two years into that project, they built a chamber outside the hospital for patients to go out and smoke because they decided they couldn't smoke in the hospital anymore. <laughs> and if I had known that, I would have just sort of assigned a rabbit to a patient and off they go because they were in an outside chamber. They had to park their oxygen outside of it so they could smoke inside of it. It's still there today. But that's where we got the idea. So we ended up looking at all different vessel types, superficial femoral arteries, carotids, and aortas. We also looked at veins and we saw differences in all of those. And then we also made the rabbits have high cholesterol as well. And then we also um, gave some tissue of pancreases actually um, to the uh, former chair at, at Rush because he was looking at pancreatic cancer and cigarette smoke. So we, we actually looked at some of the other um, parts of the animal too, but we smoked rabbits for um, about 10 years. They continued to do it after I left and then they requested the machine back. Uh, but we had about 10 years of smoking history and we did measure their coat name. We knew they were cigarette smoked. And probably the funniest thing about them, we would smoke them five days a week for four hours a day, and then wouldn't smoke them on Saturdays and Sundays. And on Monday, they were quite ready to have a cigarette. They were nervous, anxious. Oh and after eight weeks, they got little yellow whiskers. And you only could smoke them about eight weeks because they get pastorella infections and pneumonia. So it really was an acute care experiment. Julie, you were the first woman uh, chair of surgery at Hopkins. Tell us about how you picked that place and how the uh, search process went and how that all went. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting time. As I said, George Sheldon had um, really told me I should look at chair jobs. So I looked at North Carolina and they kept the inside candidate. And then I looked at Michigan and they kept the inside candidate. And I looked at Denver and they did really offer me that job and then they took it back and gave it to the inside candidate. So by the time Hopkins sort of called me, I said I wasn't interested. They sent me, actually Sir Hooney sent me an email and I wrote him back saying, you're just gonna take the inside candidate. I'm yeah. getting the drift here. And, and actually the head of the search committee was George Dover, the chair of pediatrics. So he called me and, um, so I, and Murray Sachs, who was the head of biomedical engineering. So I went out there and I realized um, when I went there that they wanted someone from outside, that the dean wanted surgery to change. It was 2003. They wanted us to get in compliance with work hours. The applicant pool at Hopkins was actually pretty small, not too many women, and only from a few schools, because most people knew we really were only interested in a few schools. And therefore, I could see there was a great opportunity to change culture. Uh, at that time, it was 2003, there was a lot of money, and so they were offering a large package to actually expand services, recreate how you would like surgery to look, and they hadn't really hired anybody for a long period of time, so it was a great opportunity. I don't think I realized how big of opportunity it was going to be, because as time went on, we really started an outcomes research center, and we expanded to four other hospitals. We really switched surgical oncology. Vascularly needed a lot of work, and we were able to expand it at, at four different sites. And we really grew our research impact factor as well as our educational program. But at the time, I went there just thinking we could rearrange it so that it would be a place that everybody would want to teach and train. We even started a PA residency program in surgery. It was very controversial because they did have an inside candidate who was a very good person. Uh, and it was pretty um, noisy when I got the appointment. Um, because not too many people were excited and people were pretty shocked because there had only been five chairs of surgery, um, all male, um, half of them from inside, but this actually had happened sort of once before when George Zydema got the job. Actually, Sabiston was supposed to get it and they gave it to Zydema and Sabiston went off to Duke and, and the rest is history. So he actually wrote me a wonderful letter saying this reminds me back 
when I took over. And he was very young when he took that job. So I wrote him back saying, was it worth it? Because I had heard he had had trouble too, where they invited him to parties saying it was casual and they'd all be wearing tuxes and, and they sort of messed with him. And he said, absolutely, it was well worth it. So he's come back a couple times during the time I was there. So the first uh, year or two, I don't remember much. Um, I was busy, um, it, there was a lot of noise. I had a seven-year-old son, you know, it was just, um, uh, a lot going on, but as I got to hire people and really create new educational forum, really open it up to residents throughout the country, add fellowships, they had very few. Um, pretty soon the faculty was 60 to 70 percent the people I hired, and we really saw a difference. It was really taught me lots of leadership uh, talents and things to do, and really getting consensus, doing a lot of one-to-one -one talking to people and really working with other chairs. I also got to help run the hospital, so I ran operating rooms and ICUs and nursing, and it really gave me an operational sense, too. So for the job I have now, I really understand what the CEO does and everything because I did part of it. So it really taught me a lot. Um, it actually made you dig deep, you know, to figure out who you are and who you're not. And the biggest lesson was to make sure you stay yourself through all of it. You don't want to end up being like those that are probably being critical or those that are not sure you can do it. And your mentors were really helpful. I used a lot of my mentors along the way. And I found good mentorship in two or three of the other chairs there that we became very good friends. And as I mentioned, Ed Miller was fabulous to get me through the whole thing. And I really think he changed surgery. I think um, right now there's some... Um, I think we just counted today, there's been 13 women chairs, and at that time I was, I think, the fifth or sixth ever. And there's about eight uh, standing women chairs right now with two or three in the pipeline. So I think we're going to see numerous women chairs of surgery. Um, so I think it really showed people you could do it. It also now opened up so that we have many surgery candidates and residents that are women. It's half women now, and therefore we'll see more women leaders, more women, division chiefs, and even more women chairs. they ascend are promoted, then they'll become chairs. I think we'll see it in the next 10 to 20 years that it will be really a, a non-issue as far as um, declaring that you took a woman chair in surgery. What do you think your biggest accomplishment was at Hopkins? Uh, I think I made the program strong in all specialties versus just one, and that I was fair across the board so that you could choose wherever you would teach and train. And we also maintain the research piece. They all go into the lab and come out really with degrees. We made sure people could get PhDs as well as PhDs in outcomes research. And I think we really embraced looking forward in outcomes research versus looking backwards and counting how many cases you did. So we really revolutionized the way we looked at surgery. We had lots of help uh, with Tim Pollack and Adel Hader and Dory Segev. All of them were excellent to do that. But we really looked at that so that our surgeons could have an opportunity to do research and still be busy clinical surgeons. Say a word about the history, of the, the importance of Hopkins in the history of surgery in the United States. Well, you know, Halstead started the first training programs and Playlock was an innovator and really made uh, cardiac surgery get on the map. Um, people don't talk about Finney as much, but he was really a uh, or Lewis as much, he was really a, an excellent um, surgeon in the community and was the first one to bridge the community as well. And then John Cameron was an incredible surgeon that made pancreatectomy and Whipple procedures possible. So the group was incredible to come from. Um, I just feel fortunate to be part of that because I think my legacy will be that I really uh, recreated the department and, and made it into um, a culture a friendly environment and brought it up to speed so that uh, everyone has an opportunity and chance. Something that would be helpful for others who watch this video, um, I'm sure you encountered some opposition over your 11 years at Hopkins. Um, what strategy do you think was the best in dealing with your opposition? So the first thing I did when I got there, uh, I was approached by one of the psychologists who worked in the, the department. Uh, they had a whole department of faculty development, and he came up to me and said, you need me as a coach. So Dick and I worked together for about six years, and he came and saw me once a month, and he was my psychotherapist, where I would tell him of the crazy things people said or did, and he would interpret them. He also taught me to have meaningful conversations where we went through and I had to fire a division chief and we role-played it. 
And when I went to do the, the firing of the division chief, he was right. I said this and he said that, and I said this and he said that. So he really taught me to have really tough conversations, but you don't have to be angry. And you can be very friendly in your confrontation of what's right and wrong. And I think that's where I got my strength. Now there were days, my family will tell you and friends, where it was insurmountable. And there is one article uh, written by the dean of student, or even faculty, Janice, where I went in and said, I'm quitting today. I've had it. I just can't take it anymore. I just don't want to sit there and try to prove my point. I think it was about three years into it. And she told me, that's exactly why we hired you. We did have a group of women who were on my search committee, and we got together frequently, too. We were called the WISE group. Uh, women in Search of Excellence. There's a vase that sits on my desk at Davis right now with that wise on it. We would get together with the Dean of Nursing, Dean of Faculty, and the three other women on the committee where we would discuss some strategies if there was something insurmountable. But it doesn't take much to get to the tipping point where people see that you work harder than they do, where you are doing cases. I took call for the first five years too, about eight weekends a year, so they would see I could take call. Uh, that you did what they did so you understood it. And then you also were in a good mood all the time. Um, I even pro broadcast that now. It, it really is great to be nice. If you're nice and friendly, people do a lot more than if you're not. And I was never diabolical or tried to get someone back. I would just keep going and keeping your enemies Velcro to your hip is great. They have no idea what you're doing and they can't understand. And pretty soon they will be here on your side. There were people that didn't want me there that after a year or two were my best allies, and some who started off with me but decided it was too much. And so people will make their decisions. You also will have a couple people that just never quite get it, and I wouldn't waste your time with those people. So Dick was very helpful. I had a coach. Um, I had um, a great administrative assistant, John Hunt, who was there already, who worked with me. And then my um, director of nursing, uh, Lisa Rowan, as well, as, and then she went off to Maryland and Deb um, Baker. They also were very helpful in helping me understand uh, the impact of what you needed to do. Wow. So last year, 2014, started yet another chapter of your life. Yes. You assumed the position as dean of a medical school. So what new challenges has this brought to you? great because I, I actually loved being chair. I was 11 years into it and I had started looking at deans again that's because George Sheldon told me I should and and as if we've all noticed things aren't going so well with health care. You know if people were doing a great job in the dean's positions um, maybe there wasn't any uh, reason to do that but very few surgeons are deans but now there's about 10 and about five of us became deans in the last couple of years and I think part of it is to really look at health care um, globally. Surgery is great because you learn how to intervene. We love disease, we love taking care of it, we wanted more volume, we wanted innovation, but it really wasn't touching uh, some of the biggest problems we have in healthcare, which is preventing disease, preventing people from coming in the hospital, and looking at healthcare for those that are underserved. And, and I wasn't spending my time there at all. And I also thought it would be important to spend some time with medical students now. I had spent a lot of time with residents and fellows, young faculty. I do a lot of advising, as you know, Melina, to people on websites and emails and, and spending time even at this meeting this week. I must have talked to 10 or 15 people that wanted a little bit of help. Um, and I really thought that I could have an impact on medical students so they could start thinking of surgery as a career, but also look at how to be a healthcare provider to prevent disease. And because I had experience with uh, the PA program in nursing, I really understood interprofessional delivery of care because I think that's what we need to expand too because we can't have doctors doing everything anymore. It's too expensive and we really need to utilize other healthcare professionals. So for all that, I started looking um, at institutions where that could be. Uh, they did have a dean search at Hopkins and I did not get that job. They hired someone from the outside. And I tried working with him, but I found myself wanting to do his job. And so no matter what he did, it wasn't going to be what I would want because I wanted to do his job. And so I started looking at those. In um, the summer of 2013, I actually was asked to look at about eight dean's positions. And I did look at a few and found that the one at UC Davis was great because we're actually working as the UC Health. Uh, we're working at all, with all five deans. We get together, all five CEOs. And I also knew Janet Napolitano was going to be the president. 
And my chancellor was a woman, my CEO is a woman, I have five women chairs, and I was replacing a woman. And also Davis sits in an area where there's a huge underserved group of people in Northern California that actually access Davis, uh, that could actually be a place where you could try to figure out how to deliver great care in a Medi-Cal new uh, accountable care situation where you need to look at systems of care. People were really friendly. Uh, there were some surgeons we really liked there, Bill Pevix there, Jim Goodnight who came from UCLA who was running the CPA. And they really looked like they wanted something new and different. They liked it that I had been at a couple UCs, but then I had been somewhere else for a while. Um, and on a personal note too, my stepkids live in California and one is in Berkeley and married and one is in LA married and I have a granddaughter that's now in Berkeley. My son is in Maryland still, but I had family out in that area as well. Wow. A another thing that you did um, for 10 years <laughs> is you were an editor-in-chief of JAMA Surgery and recently passed the baton. How did you fit that into your life? Because at the time you were basically doing that the entire time you were a chair at Hopkins. And what unique things did you learn in that role? Well, I didn't want that job, but Kathy <laughs> DeAngelis came to see me and she's just an amazing person. Um, she was editor of JAMA at that time. She was a Hopkins person, a pediatrician. She came to my office in 2005 and said, I want you to be the editor and succeed Claude Organ. And just when you think it was hard succeeding John Cameron Trice and Wes Moore, just try succeeding Claude Organ. And I said, I, I really, I have no expertise. I really don't want to do this. And she basically told me I had to, and she would make it fun. Um, I had no idea what I was getting into, actually, and she delivered um, Terry. So the t there's a woman who runs the journal with me for 10 years that had worked with her in, in pediatrics. So that was the deal. She needed to give me a managing editor because I didn't know what I was doing. And when I took over the journal, it was all paper. We had boxes. I remember one time I flew to, to O'Hara with a box of manuscripts that I edited, and I had to find the FedEx place in O'Hare to mail them back to her. It was crazy, crazy. So we took it to electronic. I learned so much by being editor. Um, it didn't take up much of my time, um, as you will find. Melina uh, uh, took over for me. And actually, I, so many people have asked me, how did you possibly get a vascular surgeon to take over for you? And a woman vascular surgeon, there's only like 10 of you, aren't they? Um, but you deserved it, as you know, because you worked with us to get the VA manuscripts online. And because of the great work you did with that, that's why you got the job. Um, so it was great because I learned how quickly to look at impact factor of articles, how to arrange things so that you can increase your quality, how to get an editorial board to work together. We had the best time at our editorial because we took a whole day to have editorial meetings unlike what many surgical journals do and try to meet in an hour. And I also could go to the JAMA meetings where I actually watched the JAMA editors, Kathy DeAngelis, all of them, see how they were running that journal who has you know, an incredible impact factor and how to interrelate to make the surgical journals better. Um, I must admit though, after 10 years, I was ready to make it go. I, there were things that we needed to do and, and our editorial board, which was young 10 years ago, not so much. We all grew up and that we actually, with a new editor after Kathy left, it was time for a new life. And if I were to tell you the one thing I'm really good at is giving things up. There's many of us that think if you give something up, there'll be nothing else to do. There's always something to do. And, and so it actually turned out really great to pass it on and also to be able to say that we had done some incredible things with it. I think it grounded me in general surgery, which was great because I was running a general surgery department and it made it so I could run uh, morbidity mortality well. I had a connection to the general surgeons. They all wanted to get in my journal and submit. It actually gave us connected to the VA surgeons where you know I had been president years before with that. And it really made um, it possible for me to really look at the full gamut of general surgery at the time I was running a department. Well, I thank you because I now have huge shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll, you'll twist and turn. I think the best thing, too, uh, Claude died about a year after I took over the journal. But as in my editorial, I knew he smiled. Every time I twisted something or changed something, and I'll do the same with you, you've already made some differences in, in putting those review articles and changing the editorial board. 
you, I, I will be delighted to watch you change it. And then hopefully she'll, you'll accept some of my papers in the future if I submit them to you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You know, besides all your management jobs and academic jobs, you've also done a lot of surgery in the last 30 years or so. And uh, it'd be nice if you told us about your favorite operations. Sure. So I was a surgeon for probably half my career before endovascular. So I went into surgery because of the big open operations. That was the 80s. That's when we didn't even know if they would work. I remember doing one of the first distal bypasses at UCLA as young faculty to her dorsalis pedis at the VA and years later I came back and it was still Peyton. I did that operation with Jeff White. He was a visiting fellow with us then. And so I loved the challenge of that. Those were the days we didn't know whether they would work. We didn't know how to do them correctly. Uh, we had new graphs. I remember presenting on new vascular graphs. So I loved open aneurysmectomies. I loved carotid endarterectomies. I even loved distal bypasses, even though as you get older, your back and neck kills you after that operation. So all of that was excellent. And I also loved following the patients long-term in the clinic. And even if you operated or didn't operate on them, that's what you did. So those were my favorite. And then Macletter also, Dr. Macletter taught me how to do first rib resections. He was the one really showing us how to do it. That was the first time you did thrombolysis for effort thrombosis. So even though my practice in many sites didn't have a lot of first rib resections, the time spent with Herb Macletter in the OR was priceless. He was a philosopher, so I'd do any case he did. He actually used to operate on a lot of movie stars. And so we would do interesting operations on famous people, and that was always interesting. And one of the stories when we were making rounds when I was a senior resident is one of them asked if I actually did the operation, and I still to this day don't know what he said, but um, I think he just smiled and we went on our way. Uh, so I loved open operations. Uh, and. Probably my favorite of all is, is really a tough open aneurysm that when you finish, um, it looks great and the patient's alive. Um, that's probably my favorite. So Julie, recently uh, at Hopkins, you did a lot of thoracic outlet surgery and did a lot of original thinking about it. And I guess uh, Herb got you interested originally, but uh, then it, how, did it, how did it morph into such a big practice? Well, when I got there, there was no thoracic outlet practice. And there was Bruce Perler, who did big open aortic operations, carotid surgery, and distal bypasses. And so I had a, a decision to make. As the chair, I wasn't going to run vascular surgery. We needed to do a lot of upgrade with endovascular techniques and hiring a bunch of people. And I really felt that we needed to hire young people to do the endovascular. And that wasn't my role as chair. So they had just been cited for the fact that they didn't do enough upper extremity and thoracic outlet surgery there. And nobody um, did that in really the whole city. And therefore I said, I could do this. So, uh, and plus I knew it wouldn't bother anyone because no one really wants to do thoracic outlet surgery. <laughs> and um, so I decided we would start. So I had this wonderful PA from, out of our first year's class. And Lisa um, stayed on with us and became the PA that helped me develop the practice. So initially, we just started saying we were open for business and we had people send us cases because nobody really wanted to do them. And then we started thinking about how our outcomes were and, and how uh, we could make a difference. And also, I wanted to show that you, if you can teach someone how to take out a first rib, then you can teach anything. Because people always say, oh, it's such a difficult case, I can't teach it. Well, I teach thoracic outlet surgery, and when I left, actually, my program director said, it's amazing you never killed anybody in 11 years because it is a small space with lots of big structures. So we started getting referrals. It took about two years to get the referrals, but they came really from um, Delaware, Virginia, uh, Connecticut, and Maryland. And then we then started getting more and more from Pennsylvania because of liability issues. People wouldn't do thoracic outlet surgery in Pennsylvania at that time. And we started seeing six to 10 new patients a week. So we decided we needed a protocol. So we developed a physical therapy protocol. We actually um, started working with a pain management person to do scaling blocks. And then the effort thromboses we got were old. They would thrombose their vein and I would see them days, weeks, months later because no one thought you should operate on them. So we never saw anybody acute to thrombolyse at all. And so we ended up taking out the rib and doing the venogram two weeks later, because that's sort of what we had available. And it turned out our patency rates were great. 
And then one of my fellows, Jim Guzzo, looked at a group that had thrombolysis and did not, and they did just as well when you follow them for patency. So we decided you really don't need to thrombolyze people. And I did warn Dr. Mackletter because he actually invented that, that you really didn't need to thrombolyze patients anymore for thoracic outlet. And so now as I'm starting a program up at Davis, because there's really not much, uh, we actually are seeing about 10 patients a week already there, and they're coming from all over. It's actually a nicer place to travel to than Baltimore to come to Sacramento. Um, and it, it actually has been great because I'm working with two young faculty. So when I left, I think I had done almost 700 cases, and we actually had published a lot so people can understand who's the candidate for surgery for neurogenic arterial venous, what's the outcome, or is it okay to do it in young people, old people. We looked at really all sorts of things to show if you are an occasional first rib person, which patients should you not operate on and where should you focus your attention. And I think we've published about a dozen papers really giving people instructions about how to choose. No, and a lot of a lot of useful information, that's for sure. And our numbers were huge, yeah. so we, we had great follow-up. We even did a quality of life survey uh, longitudinally of them over the years and also over a year. So we had some high quality things showing if you choose well with neurogenic, they actually you can make them better and you should operate on them earlier and younger if indeed they are a candidate the ones that wait 10 to 15 years just never get better. What's the best in, uh, instrumentation and, ah. and what's the best approach? Well, I use the MacLeod retractor, but now they call it the Freischlag retractor, uh, <laughs> which is a tray that holds your arm that really steadies it and lifts it up. I think it is the best retractor. There's a few others out there, but the one retractor you should not use is an intern, uh, which is how we were all raised. A person can't hold that arm up and the MacLeod retractor is great. Lighted retractors in the wound is very important so you can see. And using some periosteal elevators and the first rib rangeur that are very long are instrumental to make that happen. And somebody should be wearing a headlight. Uh, I usually don't, usually the fellow does. The way I do the operation is you draw a little picture on the drapes. We go and identify every single structure. We show it to the students, the nurses, and everyone. It really gives the fellow time to think because the danger is when people try to do it too quickly. Now, that being said, we do have an indoor record where we took one out in 26 minutes. We don't aim for it, but we had one that did come out that quickly. Um, but mainly, it's, it's really standardizing the approach. So I like transaxillary. It's much cosmetically more appealing. It's less painful because it's not in the neck. Uh, and um, patients uh, do really well with not taking out the entire scalene muscle for neurogenic. And I do think you can get to the venous part with the subclavius tendon, much easier transaxillary. The only time I go through clavicular is if you need to remove the artery, because I actually can get the cervical ribs out transaxillary too. We wrote a paper on about 35 of them, because the little teeny ones you don't need to touch, those big ones that are fused, you can just cut on either side and range her up. So in my hands, that works well. Now that being said, um, there's people that do them supraclavicular with equal results. And so we're actually setting up a registry on EPIC right now. Uh, my young partner is Misty Humphreys. And we're going to ask everyone to put in their data across the country on TOS intervention and actually look at recurrence of symptoms and patency of veins across the country. And hopefully we'll be able then to even get a better picture using EPIC to do that. Are you, is Dean actually still uh, operating or are you mentoring Misty in this? I am still operating. So I go to clinic every Monday, I see two new patients, a couple follow-ups, and I am actually have a resident with me. We have a 05 at Davis, so I have one of the 05s with me or maybe an intern from a different service. I do two to four operations a month, and for this year, I'm scrubbing on all her first ribs so that she, in her first year, has me first assisting her, just so that there's no untoward uh, outcomes, because she had never done many before. So I think we've done about 25 so far. Now, when you're dean and working with a young faculty member, you slide right in and out of that operating room. So um, I do dictate my own op notes. Uh, I do, the residents do type in my epic note, um, but I get a lot of help. She sees them post-op and the patients know we're partners. And a lot of the referrals are coming to me so that she helps me do them. So it's actually established as a center. 
frankly, it's very therapeutic. You can go in the operating room and you get exactly what you want to do. People were very nervous that I was there, but yeah. it's, it's actually <laughs> made it really great for my place. I understand the issues with the clinic. I understand the issues with the operating room. I know how epic can be tough. Um, I can walk around the hospital. That being said, I also have made rounds on the medicine services, looking at our Medi-Cal teaching service. I also have been in the ICUs. Um, so I've been many places, not practicing, but rounding with people. So it actually has made me more real. Um, I think we'll be able to manage it between her and me, and there's a third person, that they'll be able to do the volume, and I will just do a few a month. Um, some of them really just want me to do it. I have doctor's kids and doctors and things coming. So I actually think it's been great for UC Davis. Wow. Now let's shift gears a little. The SBS. Yes. So you were, as mentioned before, the first female president of the SBS. Another recurring theme for your career. There's a lot of first females. Tell us about your involvement in the SVS, and in particular, your year as president. Sure. Well, the Society for Vascular Surgery is just a wonderful organization that really has taken us from being a subspecialty of general surgery, which is where we all started. We became fellows when it was just brand new fellowships, really developed us into a specialty organization. And Wes Moore made sure I was involved with it from the very beginning. I was part of the regional societies and went to the SVS every year as a fellow and presented. And certainly every place I worked, every year we put together abstracts and data so you could learn and meet people. So it's a wonderful organization, even though it's gotten bigger and bigger, it actually really hones in your skills and makes you know who else is doing things with vascular across the country. I got very involved with initially um, the education committee because that's my thing. I love to teach and began head of that right when we started having students and residents coming. Then I got involved uh, as uh, the, the treasurer because I had been a treasurer of the AAS and I was treasurer of the AVAS. I was treasurer of a lot of societies. And partly I was just so interested in really developing our notoriety of who we were and what we did. And I also found that the people involved with the SVS really wanted to take better care of patients. I think that's what's driven us more than anything else. Innovation, taking better care of patients. So I was delighted to be the president. It was a wonderful year. It happened also to be the year I was moving for this new job, so it was fascinating to be doing that. And I also was chair of the Board of Regents the same year, so it was a little exciting. Um, but I it was great that SBS is in the same building as the college, so I could always see Becky whenever I came here. But I found it was really great. I must have gone to at least 15 different places as the president to give talks, either at uh, vascular meetings or at departments, really talking about the Vascular Surgery Society and what benefits it can give you. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to really highlight um, the need for us to be inclusive in the society, which I think we have been more and more. And I really enjoyed giving my talk really on about giving people chances, how the number of women have grown in our specialty. And also, I was able to start a strategic planning process in the, uh, in the society. And since I'd been a chair, that's sort of what I had done there. And, and I think that's probably my biggest contribution is we sort of have a plan. The staff really wanted the plan. They really needed to know what we wanted to do because we wanted to do everything and you can't. So it really came out of the staff and Becky that they wanted a strategic plan to focus them on where should our attention be and where should we put our resources. So it actually was a wonderful growing um, experience and now as you watch the strategic plan go forward with the next few presidents, I think it's really going to make uh, the SVS even more powerful. We need a better brand, we need better um, publicity, we need people to know we choose well and, and are actually do appropriate operations for appropriate indications at the appropriate time and that's our power is because we understand the outcomes from that. But it was a great year. So out of all those things you mentioned, what do you think the single most important thing that the SVS has done to advance our specialty? I think being the, the home of the appropriate intervention is what we've done. The documents we've, pre pre we've presented and published on um, outcomes as well as um, indications, those are our power. People read those and they quote those. 
So having um, the one that just came out for lower extremity bypass couldn't actually be timed any better uh, because of the yes. New York Times article, but really showing what's the data, what should we be doing, and patients read those too so that they know what the right thing is to do. So I think us publishing and really being true to our word on indications, evaluating new procedures, new opportunities for patients, and then really assessing whether they work or not. We need to probably do it louder, and that we can do over time, because now I think we're not uh, afraid of our numbers. We can actually talk with our power, but certainly um, publishing our outcomes and really giving people instruments about how to choose wisely is really our strength. Now, you've also been very involved in the American College of Surgeons, another incredibly important society to all of us. Um, another first, you're the recently uh, finished your tenure as the first female chair of the Regents. And that's a position, uh, for those who may not know, it's really uh, your second in command to the president. It's an incredibly important position. Tell us about your involvement with the college and how you think um, the college can help us as vascular surgeons? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, I got involved with the college again very early because that's where you presented your work when I was in the research laboratory and at the surgical forum and that's where you met young people and it was really great to meet um, other young surgeons because there weren't that many women surgeons so you had to go looking and so you could find them in other specialties. And I found that there were opportunities to lead in the college and I ended up being a governor of the college through the VA surgeons. So I got involved with the VA surgeons because I was a VA surgeon. I was their treasurer and, and then their president. And then I became a governor to the American College of Surgeons uh, as from the VA, not from the SVS. So I was there and ended up being secretary of the governors. And then, then I became the regent. Many people don't know we really didn't have a vascular regent until about 12 years ago, and then they decreed there should be a vascular regent. There was an interesting election of the person to be the vascular regent, which was someone that did have a vascular certificate, uh, but he did not practice vascular surgery. The first vascular regent really was J. David Richardson. I was secretary of the Board of Governors, and I really didn't think that was the right choice because he really wasn't a vascular surgeon. So I did something pretty radical. You can actually challenge the nominating committee's choice for a regent if you can get 25 of the governors, of which there's 280, to sign a petition on the Sunday before it's presented, and you can get another candidate. So I decided to put you Trout up. No one wanted to sign the petition. It took me all afternoon. Mike Belkin finally signed it, Mike Zinner, because they were scared no one had ever done this before because no one challenged the nominating committee. But Tom Russell said it was the right thing to do. I finally got 25 signatures, so I stood up and put up a second candidate, Hugh Trout. Well, I lost. J. David Richardson won. Um, it took a few years for him to get over it. Um, and then two years later, there was a slot open for a general surgery regent, and I got that spot mainly for my work as Secretary of the Governors. The minute I showed up, J. David Richardson anointed me the vascular regent, and he became the general surgery regent. No one even knows that. So I actually am now in my ninth year as the vascular regent, and it's coming up for a new regent. But really, the vascular regent was J. David Richardson, who's now the president-elect of the college. But at the time, I think it made a really good statement. And actually, the person that did all that was Ken Maddox, who's actually a first vice president right now. Because I think, again, he was just putting someone up that really wanted to be involved with the college. And oh, by the way, as a vascular certificate, this will work. Where we really wanted it to be a vascular surgeon. So if I would gotten what I wanted, I would have never been a regent. It would have been Hugh. It, and so since it didn't happen, I ended up being the regent. So again, it's another story, do what's right. Don't worry about yourself, it will turn out the right way. So no one up in the room today, there's a regent's meeting as you know, no one knows I'm not the, really the vascular regent. I was anointed, but I came in as a general surgery regent. So we're really working very hard right now to put up about five or six really good candidates to replace me. Because I think uh, the work that the college is doing in advocacy, as you know, we're in the same building with them in Washington, D.C., looking at advocacy, reimbursement, SGR, all of those things that the college does. They, we have a much bigger budget, so we should partner with them, and, and Pam Phillips does, and that's great. 
Um, the quality programs, we do the VQI, but they have programs that they can offer to smaller hospitals that can't afford the VQI. And eventually, I think we'll marry those two once we get Epic or electronic platform that can do it. Jack Cronowait's been working on that. And again, it's a great opportunity for our um, vascular fellows and young faculty to be involved on committees. Uh, they look at um, outcomes research, they have training programs, they have clinical trial programs. There's many things they can do with the college uh, and also present their work. And I think all those things gives them another venue. So your story about putting up that uh, alternate ballot reminded me of another time when you did that mm -hmm. in the SVS. Yes, I did. <laughs> but, um, that brings us to another issue, one of the common themes we've mentioned. So you've been the first female on so many things. Um, you know, the first female chair at Hopkins. I didn't mention earlier, uh, during your tenure as uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, Archives and now JAMA Surgery, you really were the only female editor in the top 25 or so of the journals. Uh, so that's also another kind of isolated female position. Um, first female president of the SVS. I mean, there's many times where you in your career, you keep encountering this first female uh, aspect. Are you surprised that in today's day and age, in 2015, you are still encountering those? I am now, you know, 10 years ago, not so much, but I actually now as a dean, there's only 13 women deans out of 115, and, and, and that shocked me. You would think that we would be along with that. Um, I do think it's a pipeline issue, and now we do have a pipeline, we'll see more women. However, I was just approached by someone at the meeting we were at this week that they have a database looking at women and men, their publications, their NIH uh, funding years, and, and it still looks like women are still tripping a bit about getting ahead. And a lot of it is they think leadership positions may actually be too much to bear and you actually will lose control of your life being a leader. And I actually think it's just the opposite. And, and perhaps one, that's one of the reasons I've gone back to interact with medical students more now is that I really think we need to ingrain in very young people that you, you should lead, that you can be a dean, you can be a chair. Look, I did it and, and I think it was a really well thought of and really a rewarding career. I think we have to instill in everyone, even women and other underrepresented groups that we need them leading to make that happen. And there's no myth about being a leader. I think part of it, too, they used to think only certain people could be chairs and chiefs and only certain people can do operations. And remember, we were trained that if you left the hospital, you know, your patient might die if your partner took over. And we were told that you were it. And without you being there, the world will fall apart. And, and now we're really into teams. And I think um, women, um, not all women, not all men, but women are a little bit better on teams because they don't always have to be the leader. They can hand things off a little easier. I think we... Um, have a little bit more attitude that we're in this together, mainly because maybe as our role as mothers and in our families, we tend to be the one that collect people. But I really think that we have to look at leadership as a, an art form that we need everyone participating. Because there is no question when I've been on strategic planning teams or when I've been in groups of people, if they're all different, we do a much better job than if we're all the same. When I go back to my sorority, boy, did we make some bad decisions, you know, because we were all the same. And, and, and you end up being more competitive when it's all the same. When it's all different, you get different ideas, and you also can see things in a different light. So, yes, I'm hoping in the next 10 years you never have to say first again. I mean, the fact that someone really thought I orchestrated a vascular surgery woman taking over JAMA surgery, as if I could, um, well, of course it could be another woman vascular surgeon. She did the work, or I did just take over for another woman dean. I think we'll see more and more of that. So being a woman surgeon that I am, and you are, um, for the women who are surgeons, there's really kind of two camps, as I'm sure you're aware. There are uh, the women who like to go to the events, the women in surgery breakfasts, and to really have that additional support network. But there are the other women who don't want to be singled out and called a female surgeon or a woman surgeon. They're just surgeons. Right. Where do you uh, fall oh. in those two camps? That's such a great question, you know, because I was at the very first breakfast for the Association of Women Surgeons back in 1983, and there were two tables of four. Patty Newman was there, 
And I met a neurosurgeon who was in her 60s who had taken care of Albert Einstein. Can you believe it? Oh so, my God. So there are those things that you get from sitting next to someone that perhaps looks a bit like you. And, and I think you see that in sports, you see that in violin players, you see that in any of those that have something similar to you. Similar to when you meet someone from your hometown or from your medical school, all of a sudden you have this little click because you have something in common to talk. Today we were just talking about the Association of Women Surgeons because there's some thought of the new generation that maybe we don't need it anymore and that maybe or we need to reframe it as a leadership um, group like ELAM versus just one that meets or has um, uh, coffees or breakfasts. Uh, I think we've gotten a lot of that. Uh, we have a, now a women's breakfast at the, uh, the American Surgical that took me five years to put together. And it was amazing when we sat there where 70 women stood up and said what leadership position they had. So maybe I think we need to reframe it. So when I was younger, it was great to have them because you didn't think there were any women. So it was nice to see a few and you could find some friends. And there's no question I found lots of friends there. Now there's women wherever you go. Really, there are half the trainees, half the young uh, surgeons are women. So you don't have to look very far. Uh, so they're around and they'll be on your committees. They'll be in your departments. So that's helping. Now I think we really need to go into leadership and figure out where people can lead, men too, as far as leading, especially now that women are partnered more with men that are doing the same thing. And we identify two groups at Davis that are struggling as well as women getting through the academic tier. One is young men, because now they're partnered with women that are out doing things, where 30 or 40 years ago, uh, the woman spouse by and large would be the one to either stop working or decelerate a little bit and the men kept going. And now they have to share and they're tired. They're trying to make it all work. They're trying to travel. And the young men are saying, I don't have enough time. And the other group are senior women now that are having to take care of their parents, mm -hmm. that they're finding themselves getting tired at this point in time. The kids are finally gone if you have kids or whatever, and now your parents are ill. And how do you manage that? Because there's a lot of emotional wear and tear when your parents get older, as well as mechanical things you have to do. Uh, having an 87-year-old dad, I'm right there. So I think doing leadership, looking at time management, really putting it into groups where we accomplish something while we're there. And I actually thought I saw the future on Wednesday when we had the AWS luncheon where there were three women on a panel of tips to negotiate. I did that panel four years ago on something else. There were about 100 women there. Uh, this week, there were 200, 300 people, standing room only, half men. I think that's the future, is that we know young men are struggling similarly. I think we still will love going out and doing a few things that women do um, that maybe men don't do. Um, but I think that a combination is good. And there is no question that when I have young women come talk to me, young men too, um, they really want to sort of hear what happened. The other thing I don't do is talk about all the bad things that happened. I have had people tell me I shouldn't make as much money as them. I have had a dean tell me they couldn't hire me as a chair of surgery because I was a woman. I have a list of things people have said to me because I'm a woman. I've had them say it to me because I was a vascular surgeon too when I came to Hopkins. They didn't think a specialist should run Johns Hopkins surgery. Uh, so you have to get beyond that because the new generation doesn't want to hear any of that, nor should they. Just like uh, your parents didn't tell you about how they suffered or the depression or monies or whatever, you really need to get beyond that and give them tools to go somewhere else. So I think the conversations we're going to have are more about how to manage where you're going versus let me tell you how much it was hard. Um, it will be hard in the future just because keeping up with innovation, electronics, uh, regulations, trying to do this whole mission conflict of research versus clinical. I mean, there's other things to worry about now. But I think, um, I really think we see the future that the new generation is, is intertwining. Well, there'll be time for women only and men only, but I, and, and same with international uh, students only. But there's really now a time of blending, just like the world is flat. You walk in and you don't even ask anymore you know, who you are because you know there's a really good chance they're a vascular surgeon. Whether a man, woman, yellow, purple, blue, short, fat, you just go, so where do you work? And you just assume that's what they do. 
You know, I, I do want to comment on the adversity part. So you say so you don't like to talk about that. But I know I speak for many when I say that we appreciate the fact that you actually do communicate the adversity that you've had in your career and how you've overcome it. Right. And so I do think that's incredibly important because one of your virtues is you are incredibly open and honest about your path. And so I just want to recognize that because it's great. I think the way I do it too, Melina, is I tell a story yes. with lots of humor. And they're all true. They're all true. But you tell the story so they go, oh my goodness. Yes. And then they go, and I don't tell too many at one setting. I, mean, <laughs> I choose one or two. Yes, you and, do. And, and there's always a new one. You know, I, <laughs> I forgot to tell you about this one to do. Um, but I think that's the way to do it too versus really dwelling in it. And, right. I, and, and you're absolutely right about yeah. it. Because you also need to tell about failures. Mike Zinner just came and gave a talk on mentorship at Davis. And he talked about every single time he failed. And it was really great for my faculty to see someone like Mike Zinner, you know, a Harvard surgeon. What do you mean you failed? He almost flunked out of Hopkins undergrad. He drove a motorcycle into the lobby of the hospital, almost got fired as a medical student at Miami. You listen to all of this. It's really great for people, I think you're right, to hear you failed or had something bad happen to you because it wasn't a slide. You didn't just slide into these positions. They're tough. I remember it was eye-opening. You were the, um, the guest speaker a year and a half ago at the AAS uh, career development course, and you were just brutally honest about the different chair jobs you looked at and the different... Uh, at that time, I believe you were looking at the dean jobs mm -hmm. and you had just gotten the dean job. Yes. And uh, I just remember the buzz among the audience afterwards at your openness, so thank you. But so let's, let's also talk about leadership. So you've had all these leadership positions. So tell us, at the core, why do you like to lead? Oh, that's a great question. I prefer to see you do something amazing more than watching me do it. So I care more about you. And I think that's what leaders do. They want others to do it, not just themselves. One of the things that I noticed looking through your CV is you've written a lot about life balance and stress and burnout and lectured on the, those topics uh, you know, in the last uh, five or 10 years. Tell us about that. Yeah, again, another serendipity story. So Charles Balch wanted to do this survey through the American College of Surgeons on burnout, and he couldn't get them to do it. And so I was a regent. So he came to me and he said, could you help me do this? Plus, we're really interested in, in women versus men. And he had met this woman who I've never met, but Lizzie Ott and I have like five publications together, and she works at Mayo Clinic. She's an internist and looks at this. So we got involved with that. And then I got really intrigued with it because it did show that there were market differences between men and women. And I do think I have an innate way of turning things on and off. And I don't know where I got that, where you can be very intense at work, but when you go home, you turn it off. And when you're home, you have fun and that you really can compartmentalize what's going on with you. It doesn't mean I don't, I'm affected, but I think I was really good knowing when I need time off and when I can't do any more, can't write anymore, where I really need to watch a movie or read a book. And even on planes, I'll do work on the way to one place, and if I get it all done, I read a book on the way back. And I've done that for 20 years, and I actually think that's a way to prevent burnout. So I think getting that data was important. We also gave the same survey to my department at Hopkins, and the percentages were actually a little bit better. We weren't quite as burnt out, but actually making sure people know you worry about that. Uh, I also have three kids. You know, I have two stepkids, and I have a 19-year-old, and today I spent 30 minutes of my time getting him a doctor's appointment in Hopkins because he has this tear duct problem. So, you know, you just do that amongst the time so that they can get care. And, and I find that relieving that, you know, texting my son, he really would like me to help him do that. So I, I think that balance has made me real, uh, made me take vacations. Um, and they also make me realize that, you know, one time my husband said, I don't need a scut list at home, you know, because you have to come home and not be who you are at work, which is lists of things and you want to know why they're not done tomorrow. So um, I think it's been really important to me, especially I've been divorced. I've moved once because of divorce. Um, we've all had some tragedies in our families. You know, my mother had an abdominal aortic aneurysm that had to be repaired and then had a bad stroke 18 months later from amyloid vasculitis. So we all sort of have these things. So you have to have some ability to move forward through them as they happen. 
And I also think if your faculty knows that you actually have work-life balance, it's better. One of my faculty, Nita Hucha, came in when I first became chair. It was a Saturday. Everybody used to come in on Saturdays at Hopkins. We stopped doing that unless you were on call. It took a few years. But I brought my son in, who was eight, and I left him at the computer, and I went off to see a patient. She walked into the chair's office, and there's this eight-year-old. And he looked up and goes, she's rounding. And he went right back to whatever <laughs> he was doing. And she goes, that's when she knew the world had changed at Hopkins, when an eight-year-old was sitting at the chair's <laughs> desk. So I think... Um, Having that real, I tell lots of stories about my son. I mean, and he's actually written things, as you know. I've published things on um, wearing different hats, he said I taught, taught him, and, and also looking at, you know, can boys be surgeons too, Mom? I've had that in an article when he asked me once. So he actually has made that better, and he thinks this is what moms do. You know, he, he really didn't think that was any different uh, as he grew up. So he actually has uh, maintained my sanity through all of that. So you've had a lot of successes. I'm sure you've had some failures. Oh, yes. So how do you respond to failure? And what lessons have you, can you impart on this? Yeah. So the first chair job I looked at was the first time someone told me no, because I went and looked at a job at San Diego, got it, Zinner and had me come back. I looked at the Milwaukee job and got it. And so then I went off to North Carolina thinking, well, OK, I want this job. Um, and I didn't get it, you know, so we went out, went out twice, and I didn't get it. And I came back home, and I was like, well, how did that happen? You know, obviously, I did, and I was devastated that I didn't get it. Um, and then realized that as you go up the chain, you're going to be one of five that are terribly qualified, and it's a fit. That was probably, the, and then how do you tell people? Similar when I got divorced, I thought, well, I'm, I failed. How can I tell my students that my marriage failed? Because that also shows you couldn't control it. So I think those things you can't control, you know, get divorced or they don't choose you, um, it's hard. I think the best thing about it is you're going to end up somewhere better, which is really hard to see for a couple years. But you ended up, oh, by the way, I became chair at Hopkins. And I found Phil, who's a wonderful husband of 22 years and had Taylor. So you do end up better, but at the time, you feel embarrassed, bad, and how could I have controlled that situation? So I think giving up control uh, is the best way to take care of failure. Not getting grants the first time, I think I've heard that from many of our people who are incredible researchers. They say, come look in my closet of pink slips, you know, look at what I never got. And, and listening to leaders tell you that. So the grants you didn't get, and then certainly, you know, the patients that died on the table or the bypass that went down or the stroke that you had after the carotid, which we all have them. You remember their names, you remember who they are, and, and the sheer disappointment that you couldn't control that piece for that person. And really being able to split that, that you did your best, and that when you are a risk taker as a surgeon, that's going to be devastating. Um, so part of that, I think, is um, when my mother had her aneurysm, um, I was shopping her films around because she needed an open repair, but I was trying to get someone to do her endovascularly. And, and uh, Roy Greenberg actually looked at the films for me. And I, I was at Federal Hill with my parents when he called me back. And he said, you know, she's got a short, fat, angulated neck. Julie, she, I could do something, but she really needs an open repair. And he goes, do you realize that no one really wants to take care of your mother? <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't realize that. He goes, you need to realize, Julie, that you cannot control the situation and that what you need to do is uh, do her where you want, which I wanted to do at Hopkins. Bruce did her so I could have her under my purview. But that was one of the best things Roy ever said uh, to me was like, get a grip. You know, we're not going to do what you say, Julie, because you can't control this. Um, but I think those failures are, are learning that you can't have everything. Um, and I think the other thing is um, not everybody's going to like you. And, and I actually thought that I got to choose who I liked and everyone liked me. And they don't. You know, when you get powerful positions, people are jealous that you got. And you have to make decisions that people don't like. You'll have a style that's different than others. And some people just don't like it. And some people won't quit talking about it. You know, even yesterday I heard something that someone said, and you're like, oh, really? You know, and part of it is to make sure that you're not like that, but to realize if you are going to be a leader and make a change, not everyone's going to like you. 
And that's really hard because you really want everyone to like you. Now, you don't want 90% of people not to like you. That's bad, but you know, 10% is not too bad. What can we do to make surgery more attractive as a career choice to medical students, both women and men? Because as you know, we do still have an issue attracting women medical students to right. surgery. Well, I think um, being flexible to realize that a career in surgery can be multiple things. So in our specialty, if you do varicose veins, you're still doing interventions. And we had a time where if you weren't doing thoracal abdominal aneurysms, you were not a real vascular surgeon. And we didn't even do veins. We didn't do thoracic outlets. Some people think that's not worthwhile doing. And that there's times in your life that you can be a little less busy and a little more busy. And that research is important, administration is important, vascular lab is important, and that you need all of it. Just like when I've told other vascular surgeons, do you want to do the veins? Well, if you don't want to do the veins, let her or him do the veins. And similar, you know, do you want to do the research? Well, then they're going to do the research and accept people for what they want to do and how they want to do it. And not to judge others by your cover, that whatever you do is what you're going to do. Now, the other thing that's great about our field, these new endovascular techniques and innovative techniques, they're shorter, they're not as uh, grueling, the patients do better, and we're also choosing not to operate on people they're not going to do well. We all know that 90-year-old with a bad heart and a thoraco really needs to go home and that we don't need to try anymore. And we really have changed our landscape from can it work to we know it works or doesn't. So I actually think we're smart enough to manage patients that way. I think we also are working in teams more, so we will allow a team of five or six or seven. We let our partners watch our patients. We're using nurse practitioners and PAs to go around for us or see post-ops. Uh, we let people email us. And the other thing we're doing at Davis, we're using telehealth a lot, where you can sit and talk to your patients or talk to each other over electronic means and make decisions without them coming in and also having conferences where you don't have to show up, where you can do teleconferencing and making it, I think traveling is a really hard thing for young uh, faculty to do that. Uh, and then in private practice, having more and more people be on call schedules so that you're not always in the hospital. And it's okay that you have something to do with your family and even though you're bypass clotted, that it's okay that your partner's gonna declot it for you, that that's okay. Because actually the patients will say it's okay. So. I did a bypass on a patient, a woman, and right before the distal knife passed, my kid got a 103 temperature in daycare, and I had to go. My husband was out of town. So my partner, Bob Cambry, finished it. So the next day, I told her, you know, I had to leave. My partner finished your bypass. And her question was, how was my kid? So I actually think there are times, now you can't leave the proximal anastomosis or a ruptured aneurysm, but you can, and I did that for a partner down in San Diego, too. I finished a case because his kid was in the emergency room. So. I think being verbal about what you need and realizing that you can work teams at work is the way to go. With the, all the endovascular inventions that are so wonderful for the patients, how do you have advice for us who are trying to teach people to still do open operations? Right. I think similar to 10 years ago where you were trying to find places to get endovascular training and they had those mini fellowships and regionalized. I think we're going to have to look at a regional way to solve that problem. I used to think that we would come up with bigger open operations to replace the old ones, and I wasn't convinced they were going to replace a lot of them, but I've changed my mind. I actually think many of ours, as well as percutaneous aortic valves, all of these things are working, and I think they're only going to work better in the future. I, I think they are, too. So I think what we'll need to do is to look at our training centers and keep tabs on what the people are doing. And if you don't have enough open aortic, I really right now I think aortic operations are probably the ones that you need more time to get good at them. I think there's still enough carotids. I'm not sure how many distals you need to do to be good. They're so painstaking. Two or three might be enough, you know, before you're good. But because um, it's pretty simple stuff and no one dies from them, you just have to take your time. I think we have to look at regional. So say you're in Chicago, you know, look at who's doing the most open operations and have your fellows rotate there. I think the 05 programs are helpful too because you can incorporate maybe three or four hospitals, some of the more rural hospitals where maybe they're doing some more open things so they have opportunity to do those procedures. 
At the same time, they, you also have to have sites where they're learning new things. So you actually could switch that. Say you have an incredible vein center, you ship your, they ship your fellow to you and you ship yours to them mm -hmm. for three months to do some open work. And then also, I think when they join practices, you have to really have a big proctoring uh, where you bring them into your practice. They scrub with you, just like what I'm doing with Misty for this year, is that I'm scrubbing. Mean, she can do that, okay? She can do it after the fourth one. But I'm in there, so we just did one where the first rib had been fractured, and it was really a tough case. So I think spending a little bit more time uh, proctoring. We probably needed it 30 years ago, too, but we didn't dare ask. And I certainly remember many times where I really needed some help, but you just sort of grinned and bared it. And, and I think um, that probably wasn't the right answer. But here, I think asking more people in the operating room and being more of a proctor once they're there. Because if their practice is going to involve that, you need to make sure they're doing it in a good quality and outcomes manner. What is the single greatest challenge you have had to overcome to date? Being chair at Hopkins. It was really tough. And um, someday I'll write a book on it. Um, and I actually just got someone to help me think about how to write it with stories. Um, and I think the reason it was so tough, everybody wanted that job. And when I got it, they wanted to make sure I knew that I shouldn't have gotten it. And that was the toughest thing. But the greatest joy was doing it really well. Well, that kind of uh, goes into the next question. What do you consider to be the highlight of your career to date? Having my son. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as far as um, your career. career, always having another opportunity to do something. So right now, it's being Dean at Davis. Um, it's the best opportunity I have. I am an elite group of 100 people that are going to set health care and create a better way to serve people. It's the highlight of my career right now. What advice would you give to aspiring surgeons? You have to be really good. You know, get trained so that you're an excellent, excellent surgeon, not only technically, but emotionally, uh, making sure you have good emotional intelligence, situational awareness. Just be really, really good and spend as much time as you need to get good. And some areas are going to come easy, some are not. Reassess all the time, are you happy doing what you are doing? And if you're not, adjust. Find something else to do because your life is not forever. And you might as well be going to work with a smile on your face and enjoying it every day. And whether it's less work, more work, different work, find something that really gives you joy to have that happen. And also realize these jobs and things are are not myths. You can do any of this. You can go in and make a difference in anything you do, whether it's you know, chief of staff at your hospital, running a research lab, um, having the best vein center in the town. You can do all of that really well. Uh, and you can make a difference doing that. And people will remember you because of your kindness and your ability to share. So I think that um, realizing we are so fortunate to be able to do this for a living and that we are lucky um, to be healthy enough to continue to do it for a long time, um, and lucky us. Is there any separate advice you would give to women who want to pursue surgery, or is it the same? I think it's the same advice, but I said that. Uh, but don't be worried if you feel inadequate, challenged, or um, overwhelmed. Because the one thing, there's a new book that just came out showing that men feel that too, but it doesn't bother them. So that when men feel overwhelmed and, um, and, and absolutely devastated, they just go, oh, well, let's keep going. Where women actually pause more, and I actually think we're going to find that in this study, is that and maybe it's the way we're raised or how we look at ourselves. Men will apply for jobs they're not qualified for and wonder why you didn't hire them. Women will wait till you fulfill 100% of the boxes before they apply. So I think we can learn a lot from each other, not that you should apply for things you're not qualified for, um, but, but I think women need to realize that feeling of um, stress, strain, inadequacy, we all feel. Every time you go in for a ruptured aneurysm, we all have that feeling, oh my God, and that's okay. Uh, you're gonna do fine and, and move on with that. 
And there is literature out there showing in all fields that that feeling is good. Your patient wants you to feel stressed and overwhelmed and worried that you can't do this. And, and, and that's what you need to know that everyone's feeling that way. And it's okay to talk about it. So Julie, I want to say on behalf of myself and Walt and Dr. Yao and the SVS, it has truly been an honor and a privilege to be able to conduct this interview with you today. Thank you. And it's been my privilege as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Thanks.